the storms keep raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. Still that hope that lies within is reassured. As I keep my eyes upon that distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that secret place he has prepared. But if the storms don't cease And if the wind keeps on blowing My soul has been go home and tell somebody I got chills in church, y'all. These guys are good. <clears throat> I'm going to run it back a little bit this morning, and I'm going to take it back about as far as I can take it to start out this series on stewardship. And what I want to tell you is, as I preach, I'm not really talking about stewardship in as much as I'm speaking about money. I'm going to talk about life and how then we can apply life to our treasures and our stewardship. But I want to run it back, and I want to tell you the creation story, a little bit of it. 
but enough of it. This is the story of creation from Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed a man from the ground of the earth. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were very pleasing to the eye, and trees that were also good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The name of the second river is Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to care for it and watch over it. And yes, Roger, to steward it. But... The Lord God said to the man, You are free to eat of any of the trees in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of knowledge or of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly no longer have life. I had a dream this morning in the wee hours that gave me the coolest idea. You may say a strange angel messenger spoke to me and changed my sermon for this morning. And I'm going to give you something I have never seen nor read of. Listen to this. I started looking at the names that are mentioned here in Genesis 2. Now, usually, me and you... When we are reading through the Bible and we see these names like Hyshan and Cush, we'll just read over them really quickly and ask God for forgiveness for not pronouncing them right. Is that correct? Or if we see names like this in the Bible, we'll say, I sure hope the preacher isn't going to ask me to read this week, and i got to get up there and try to pronounce those silly names. But when I see names like that in the Bible, it makes me wonder why they were even put there. I mean, he could have told the story without adding the names, but he added the names to tell the story. Now, check this out. I use the power of AI, artificial intelligence, to look up the na each of these names that were mentioned. But the first thing I want you to note, because it was the first thing I noticed, is that there are seven names mentioned here. Now, if you're Sherry Tall or a Bible scholar, when you see the number seven, it matters. Because for the Hebrew people, seven is a complete number. Even in the secular world, we call it the lucky number. But that's because for the Hebrew people, the number seven was significant. It represented completeness, fullness. So that was my first clue that there's something going on here. But then I let AI help me out by figuring out what each of those words meant. You see, names point to something. Like Jesus means God saves. Thank you, Lord. That that's what Jesus means, because that's what God did. So I said to myself, each of these names must point to something. So let me point it out. Seven names. The first name is Pishon. It means springs forth. That's what it means. The second name, Havilah, means sand or ground. The third name, Gihon means 
person. A nondescript person. It just means person. The fourth name, Cush, means springs forth. The fifth name, Tigris, means authority, power, or how the King James said, dominion. Check this out. The sixth name, Asher, means happiness, contentment. And then the seventh name, Euphrates, means springs forth. Let me read the story really quickly for you again. This is the story of creation. Then the Lord God formed a man from the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Do you know what that word, breathe, ruark? If you take it, it actually means the same thing as the phrase springs forth. The ruach of God sprung forth and gave life to man who came from the ground. And God planted him in a garden east of Eden, and there he put him whom he had formed, and he made all kinds of trees grow, trees that were pleasing to the eye. And in the middle of the garden was the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge and good of evil. And then God took him and put him in that garden to care for it, to bring happiness and contentment to him and the land. And he said, you're free to eat from any of the trees, but do not eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, for life will be removed from you if you do. Let me say these words back to you again. Haishan. Springs forth, Havala, from the ground, Gihon, person, Cush, springs forth, Tigris, authority, dominion, power, Asher, happiness, contentment, Euphrates, springs forth. Is that not wild? Now, I might not be a mathematician, Ray Robertson. But I'm a pretty daggone good Bible scholar. And I can tell you that those names weren't put in there accidental-like. I can tell you, you know, most preachers stand up and they give you a geography lesson all of a sudden. Well, the Tigris and Euphrates was put in there so we'd know where creation happened. Let me tell you, those seven names were put in there so that you would know how creation happened and why creation happened. Wow, I mean, my mind went boom this morning. i got to share this with somebody. Y'all aren't as excited as I am. I mean, this is groundbreaking publishing stuff. AI is powerful. Woo! AI is powerful. I had a uh, staff meeting this week. Michelle knows. We hadn't started our meeting, and Mary Glenna, one of our staff members, was she was all anxious. She said, i got to write this uh, Christmas play for my church. Like, they tasked her, and she said, it can't be too long, and it's got to have all the characters, and I want it to tell the story. I said, watch this, Mary Glenna. I pulled up chat GPT. I said, I want a Christmas story with all the characters, and I need it to be a thousand words long with a narrator. One minute later, I printed it off and I handed it to her. Is that not crazy? AI is powerful. Imagine that. Something we created from sand, silicon. Woo! Now you're popping. Now you're picking up what I'm putting down. Something we created from sand and silicon to improve life, to help us care for life in the best sense. Elon Musk might disagree with my interpretation of AI. But in the best sense, to improve life, to take care of life, to make the world a better place, please God. But as humans now, we are afraid of the threat that AI poses to us. Imagine that, if you will, just for a second, something that has been created with intelligence to make the world a better place that all of a sudden backfires and starts doing its own thing, not what it was intended to do, and starts causing destruction. Am 
I still talking about AI? Or am I talking about actual intelligence? Yeah. Now you see how the past can become our professor. Now you see why I ran it all the way back to Genesis. Because let me read the final end to that story for you just real quick. Here's the end of the story. And the Lord God said, the man has become like one of us. He knows the good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand also to the tree of life and live forever. So God banished the man from the Garden of Eden. Imagine that. Intelligence and knowledge becoming the ruination of life and God's perfect design. Imagine something that has been created thinking it's smarter than its creator and taking over and doing things its own way. Thank God we're not like machines. I think you get where I'm going. I don't think I need to explain that anymore. The past is a professor. Look what got them kicked out of Eden. Thinking they were smarter than God. The past is a professor. The only thing that separates us from machines is what's in here. Our hearts. The ability to love. The ability to have empathy. The ability to be generous. To give. That's the only thing that separates us from mindless machines. So what? So what, preacher? You made a couple good points. How can I apply this to my life? Well, if we want to be intelligent, we can be intelligent. But we know where that's going to get us. If we want to be wise, we'll pay attention to God's good design. Now, you want to know what I noticed about this scripture? The only other living thing that's mentioned in that passage of Genesis 2 I read to you are trees. I've been thinking a lot about trees here lately. Man, that tree in my front yard, that maple tree, is as pretty as it's going to be all year. And I've been pondering that, because pretty soon that daggum tree's going to drop every one of them leaves, and I'm going to have to get out there and rake it and bag it, and I got maple trees and oak trees, and some of y'all got hickory trees, and my yard is is full of trees. So I've been, I've been thinking about trees. I think we can learn a lot from trees. It's the only other thing that was living in that story. So it's all I got to work with. So let's ponder trees for a minute. I think trees can teach us something about stewardship and life. Here's what they can teach us. Beauty comes from within. Did you know those gorgeous yellows and oranges and browns are inside of those leaves all year long? Did you know that? That the leaves are actually overpowered by chlorophyll? Now, I'm not a scientist, remember, Ray? But I did go to grade school science, and I know that the chlorophyll is what extracts from the sun and allows the tree to be fed. It gives its identity to the tree when they're full. I mean, I drew them in school and made them, you know. It gives the tree its identity. But that orange and yellow and brown is inside there all year long. Here's a lesson from a tree. The most beautiful things come from within. The most beautiful things are right there inside of us. Sure, we can have all the wealth in the world. We can have all the things surrounding us. And we can look like we got the world on a string. And inside, we can be falling apart. How many times have you seen it? The things of life do not satisfy. Beauty comes from within. Now... I can go to the doctor and I can get me some Botox to fix these wrinkles and it'll make me a little bit more pretty on the outside, maybe. We 
can all do that. We can do things to make us prettier on the outside, but it doesn't fix what's within. The most beautiful things come from within. Learn that from the trees. Here's the second thing you can learn from the trees. you got to give up to gain. I want you to think on those trees for just a little bit. Those leaves are their sustaining life force. That's it. They've got those leaves out there, and they're catching all the sun. And then once a year, every year, the Lord calls upon them to give up that very thing that gives them life and security and identity. And it doesn't just happen once in a lifetime, church. It happens every single year that they got to drop those leaves and stand naked, exposed to all the elements. And they have to trust in God. Wow. Wow. You have to give up to gain. We have to give up as humans to gain. It's the only thing that separates us from machines, is knowing that we are part of something bigger, that the stuff we're given in life by God to sustain us is part of a bigger picture and a responsibility to take care of things outside of ourselves. It's God's design for the world that the trees teach us every single year about this time. Thank you, Lord, that I got a stewardship sermon from a tree. Because you have designed every year for them to give up what is most valuable to them and depend on you, our God, the one who gives, the one you can't outgive, and wait. On God to deliver. Whoo! I love that. Giving up is essential to life. Giving up something that makes us feel safe and secure, like money, valuables, it's hard. But letting go is important to the rhythm of life. Learn this from the trees. They are most beautiful when they are revealing what's inside. They are most beautiful when they are giving up and trusting on God to provide. Our job as Christians is not to do mathematics. I've illustrated that just fine with my letter. Our job as Christians is to give up, to practice giving up, to be like trees, to reveal something that is beautiful on the inside, to give up so that we can make room for God to give back. If you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've got to give that up too. It's the only way. You've got to give it over to him. You've got to be completely exposed. You've got to say, I can't do it alone, Lord. You've given me this life, but really it's yours, and I'm giving it back to you. If you haven't done that, I would ask you to do that today. Maybe you've already done that, and you're saying, well... I want to give my membership to this church. If that's you, would you come forward today? Maybe you've never been baptized in your life, and you want to be baptized. We'll baptize you. Maybe you want to just come forward for prayer with Pastor Michelle or pray with me. Whatever the reason, if the Spirit has moved you to be more alive today, to be more human, why don't you come forward today and give something up? (laughs) 